Did you hear the news? Cinema Talk is now on social media. Check us out on Twitter at Cinema Talk 19 and Instagram at Cinema Talk 2020 for the latest on news, guest previews, polls, and episode previews. It's like music to my ears, because it is music to our ears. On the new episode of Cinema Talk, we get together to celebrate the music of film with a couple of very familiar faces. Welcome to the Film Score reunion here on Cinema Talk. And now, please, quiet on the set. Welcome to a new episode of Cinema Talk, Movie Talk for College Movie Fans. My name is Allende. I am your host. And today, like I said in the intro, it's a film score reunion. (laughs) I have two of some of my friends from a class that we have taken called Music and Film. First on my right, I got my man Justin. Justin, how you doing? I'm doing fantastic. Good to be here. Good to talk about some music. I'm excited. And then right across from me, I have a a great friend of mine, Angela Tolome. Angie, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me back. Of course. All right, so since you guys aren't new here, we're going to jump right into the show. You already know what, our, what time it is. It's time to talk about some movie money. <laughs> it's the box office wrap-up. And so we're going to talk about the box office of last weekend. It was a very tight race, but in the end, Sonic and Hedgehog claimed the victory with $26.3 million. becomes the fourth highest grossing video game movie of all time, and it passes $200 million uh, worldwide at the time of this recording. Second place, shockingly enough, is Call of the Wild overperformed expectations at $24.8 million in its opening weekend. Decent audience reception. It's got 90% of Rotten Tomatoes and the cinema score scored an A minus. However, with a $135 million production budget, it's going to be a little bit hard to try to, to get any sort of profits from that. Coming in at third is Harley Quinn Birds of Prey at $7 million. Domestic total is a measly $72 million, and its estimated loss is at least $60 million. It could reach even higher. At number four and five, this was another battle, but in the end, Bad Boys for Life came through at $5.84 million, domestic total reaching just over $200 million. And then at number five, we have Brahms, The Boy 2, the sequel to uh, the horror film The Boy, $5.82 million. And it feels like this is another case of sequelitis. So, I mean, I think the big story right now is Sonic the Hedgehog doing a really, really well, given a lot of the sort of background things mm-hmm. that happened with the film prior to its release. Even And also keep in mind that the Chinese release date has been pushed back due to the coronavirus, and it's still already at $200 million. Man. I mean, I think that is huge, but I mean, Call of the Wild getting this much attention and then having a 90% rating on Rotten Tomatoes, I was hoping this movie would be really good because I love the book and in high school, I read it senior year, talked about it in one of our episodes previously that I was on, but I was hoping this movie would be good, especially because it has Harrison Ford in it. So happy that it's one of the top grossing movies this past week. People like their dog movies. I don't, but people like their dog <laughs> movies, so obviously that's going to make some money. Yeah, all right. Now we got to get into some the movie news roundup. We picked out three stories. We actually had to make an amendment to one of the stories because this is huge. Huge story that broke out yesterday at the time of this recording. A shakeup has happened in the house, and it's one that came out of absolutely nowhere. Mm-hmm. On Tuesday, former Disney CEO Bob Iger reportedly stepped down from his role as chief mm-hmm. executive officer of the Walt Disney Company, effective immediately. Iger, who supervised the immense success of franchises such as the Marvel Cinematic Universe and the Star Wars sequel trilogy, has named former Disney Parks chairman Bob Chappick as the new CEO, and Iger will serve as executive chairman until his contract expires on December 31st, 2021. As a result, Disney stocks fell about 2.5% after the announcement. Where did this come from, and what could this mean for Disney going forward? I mean, I don't know. They're so much bigger than they ever were now. And I mean, they're always big, because that's who they are. And I don't know if you get the surge with Disney+, and people want more from them. People are disappointed with the things they keep putting out, because they've taken over the Star Wars universe. I think people just demand so much, and the slightest thing sets them off. And when the slight thing is set off, they just throw their hands up. That's a really good point. But you also got to think about this guy's personal life as well. There's something must have happened if out of nowhere his contract expires in 2021. So 
if he wanted to make this decision. He had another year and a half, pretty much, to make this decision. Why it was so sudden, something must have be going on, either with him personally or in Disney. Or professionally. What other studios want him? They yeah. know he's got pool. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this. keep in mind, this is coming off hot in the heels of the, the 21st Century Fox buyout. Mm-hmm. So this is just, it's shocking to me that Iger is just stepping down, especially with a year, year and a half. Kudos to him for going out on top. He's... Disney's the king of the box office right now, king of the movie industry right now. Yeah. So, I mean, it, why don't you step down on a high note rather than wait for your contract to expire and then maybe Disney might take a dip during in the next year and a half, which mm-hmm. it ain't happening because it's yeah. Disney. But I mean, they who, already have so much in the works. I mean, you got the two Pixar movies coming out. You got some of the live action. I mean, the live action Mulan that's coming out. Disney's not mm-hmm. going to take a dip because of this. But I think because they already have so much planned, but... I think this will take more of an effect of planning the next, like, four or five years. Mm -hmm. Because this is so sudden, now you might have to make some changes with some movies. Some of the shows coming out on Disney+. And like you said, Angie, might have just been too much for him, all the demand because of Disney+. Mm -hmm. All right, so moving on to our second story, still on the topic of Disney. Because even with this shakeup, the reign of the mouse has yet to be usurped. The Disney live-action remake trend has been going strong, and new reports show that it is in no rush to slow down. According to Disney news site Diz Insider, Disney is reportedly beginning production for a live-action Rapunzel movie. Nutcracker and the Four Realms screenwriter Ashley Powell will be writing the script, while Moneyball producer Michael DeLuca has signed on as producer. No word as to if this film will be related to the 2010 animated feature Tangled. What are our thoughts on this reported project, and... Should this be the end of the Disney makes? The screenwriter from Nutcracker in the Four Realms is writing this, and it wasn't good. Why? Like, I'm it... over it. I'm <laughs> done. Also, Tangled it was... like, just came out. Like, I know whatever. It was like a decade ago. But, like, come on. And, that, and that's the thing. Like, with, with these kind of live-action remakes, I think this hopefully will be the end of it. Because yeah. with I love the idea that... Disney does with like Mulan and taking the original story and placing it in a live action. But the thing is, I don't think Rapunzel's for live action. Tangled did what it was supposed to do and show a different side of Rapunzel. You don't have to go back to the beginning because that's not what you're supposed to do in Tangled and that's not what you're supposed to do now. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I have some bad news because apparently Disney's also thinking about doing live action Bambi, which that's going to be a nightmare. Why? Oh, it's going to be a train wreck of the most beautiful <laughs> kind. There are going to be so many children. That are going to be scarred. A cartoon version didn't traumatize us all It's like Dumbo. It's like coming out with a live action Dumbo. Like, that wasn't... Oh, wait. They did. Oh, wait. (laughs) They did. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Disney, and we talked about this in one of our earlier podcasts on Cinema Talk, and how Disney has almost no originality anymore in the stuff that it comes up with. The only place in Disney that has any originality is Pixar. You see the two new Pixar movies that are coming out. Pixar is the only place that has any originality whatsoever. This would be the reason Disney dies, to be honest, because they have no more screenwriters that are original. Right now, if they either way, it's going to is not going to be a, a good look for Disney mm-hmm. again because you like you said, is you're just banking off the success of another story that you've already done. Like yeah. come up with something new, come up with something, come up with something original, akin to like Moana and Coco, where these are concepts that like maybe new, inspired new stories that need to be told from different perspectives as well like you use the power that you have to start branching out and doing different things things that right. are benefiting the most people and showing different identities that's what you should be doing right. however i'm not saying that you nix live action altogether. you can do live action for things that live action is made for treasure planet Oh, man. Would be a fantastic live action. Awesome. So things that live action would look good for. Also, Atlantis. Yes, I was just going to say Atlantis. That'd be so good. It would look fantastic. I don't know why they're taking these movies that are so popular. Leave the popular movies alone. They don't need to be even more popular. How about you take a risk in a movie that a lot of fans like, but it's not as popular. Put it on the big screen. It'll be so popular. Yeah, it will be. 100%. Absolutely. We're going to move on to our third story. We're going to be getting into the music now. 18-year-old megastar Billie Eilish saw success in the charts, success at the Grammy Awards, and now we'll see success on the big screen. Eilish released her single No Time to Die, the new opening credit song for Kerry Joji Fukunawa's No Time to Die. The single is now sitting at over 36 million views on YouTube and has received, generally, positive responses. 
No Time to Die will feature Daniel Craig once again as the suave spy James Bond, and he will be joined by Rami Malek, Lea Seydoux, Lashana Lynch, and Naomi Harris. What are our general responses to the song, and how would we rank it compared to the other Bond songs like Skyfall and Writings on the Wall? I think it's pretty good. You know, we've got, what, seven decades, six decades of Bond under our belt. Um, and there's a way to keep the, the suave spy. And, you know, the, of course, like how it's always been with the James Bond theme songs where the, the theme itself is found sparkled throughout what, what she's, what, 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 what the songwriters are doing. And I think it's pretty good. I think it's a great way to slide the audience in, especially just based off the preview for No Time to Die and the color palette of it and everything. Like, this is very slick. Okay, this is my first like exposure to Billie Eilish. Mm -hmm. I hadn't I hadn't listened to like Bad Guy or anything like that prior to listening to No Time to Die. So this is my first experience listening to her, and I I like the song. I do think, however, comparing it to all the other Bond songs, I feel like it is like the weakest. And that's not trying to say that the song is not good. Right. It's saying like uh, they're all fairly good for in their own separate mm -hmm. ways. Like Skyfall is fantastic. Skyfall. It's on Especially when you pair Skyfall with the with that like absurdist surreal like the intro and like the thing everything. with each of these is they each have their own style. Mm -hmm. I would say that No Time to Die that it is kind of like what was the third one? Writings on the Wall. Yeah. I would say it's like Writings on the Wall as far as what it sounds like and what like the theme of it is and how it's produced. But, I mean, I think Skyfall is the best, mostly because I like more orchestral stuff. I like yeah. it full. This one didn't seem very full to me at all. Not saying that it wasn't a good song. Billie Eilish, fantastic voice. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. I think it's great. It just depends. What are you trying to convey? And if they, try, if they are conveying what they want to convey, then hands down. Yeah. This is a great song to use. I do think this is a great song for Daniel Craig's swan song as James Bond. Yeah. The, here, here's the thing that's going to determine whether or not I'm, I like this song and how it compares is that I need to see the opening credits yes. to the song. Because the, the one for Spectre, I love a lot with Sam Smith's writings on the wall. I know people really don't like the way Sam Smith's falsetto in that song. And I to be fair, it hurts a little bit sometimes, but the visuals that pair with that song, it completely overshadows like any yeah. problems that I have with the song. It, even with Skyfall, like like you were just talking yeah. about, like the visuals, the opening visuals for Skyfall pair with that song better. is yes. fantastic. Absolutely. I could watch that for a day. Like, I was telling Justin that when Skyfall first came out, I had that song on my playlist for the next five years. <laughs> yeah. Because that song was just so good. But yeah, I'm excited for No Time to Die. I'm excited to hear and see what they do with the opening credits. Now we're going to move on to the big topic of the story. Yep. Come on, guys. We, we're all big music people here. We love music. We love movies. And we love music in movies. Mm -hmm. And so... I'm going to say, I want to ask something like just where, what was the movie that sort of got you into like thinking about music in movies differently? And I know that sounds like a weird question. Hmm. I think the one that made me start thinking, because I've never really, I mean, I've always been like a music person. I think it was The Godfather. When I saw that when I was younger, like that was what made me go, oh, you can really, you can set an entire environment, you can create an entire atmosphere with a film score. I think all of us are subconsciously, like, we know what film scores do to us emotionally. So I think throughout my entire life, I've had that, but I don't think it was until a movie like Inception came out, mm -hmm. when the music was so weird and it went with the plot so well that I had to pay attention to the music. I had to pay attention to how it was scored by Hans Zimmer. So I think, again, scores like that, that were just so weird, you have to pay attention to them, that weren't like original orchestral scores that happened, what, like 20 or 30 mm -hmm. years before that. Okay, my story is actually pretty funny. So I was watching Speed Racer, <laughs> <laughs> and I was just, I remember this. the movie is very colorful, and it's also not good, but... <laughs> The music was just, it was, it fit like the sort of very vibrant tone that Speed Racer was going for. Yeah. And it just made all the race scenes, it would just feel so much more epic and for more, so much more fun. And I was like, I was just bobbing around to the music. And I remember listening to the ending credits theme where they did a rendition of the Ghost Speed Racer theme from the, the anime. And I was like, oh, wow, this is really cool. I want to listen. I like listening to this. Yeah. And I would just literally play that song on loop or I would watch the end race at the Grand Prix 
and just listen to it. And I'm just like, oh, this is awesome. I love this. Mm-hmm. And it was it was weird. And that's that was a Giacchino score, believe it or not. Yep. After that, then I got into listening to Hans Zimmer because of Inception, which is like that's the genesis of my love for film. Yep. Was watch just seeing what Christopher Nolan did, and I was like, I need, I need to do. I want to do <laughs> this. And then that, that got me watching a back catalog of every like all of the well, some of the greatest hits of all of cinema. Dude, we're not just the only ones that are becoming more fascinated with music in film. It just seems like there's this culture that's um, has been formed just about music in film, and it's I think it's very fascinating. It's great because it gives us more to talk about when you're talking about movies. It's not just about the actors anymore. It's not just about the direction. You know, film film can have great music, or it can be saved by its music. Yeah. A lot of times yeah. a movie is saved by its music and because the movie may not be all of that great or sometimes you can have a character who's just so despicable but like the theme for that character is just it's so good. So good. So I, again, I'm just going to ask like some of our personal favorites. Let's go ahead and just talk about some of our personal favorites and you know what? Why not just why not expand it? Let's not we can we don't just got to talk about movies. We got to talk about television shows. If you're a oh, big yeah. cartoon person, you got you want to talk about cartoons. If you're like me and you love anime, you talk about some anime music. So I'm a huge fan of a show called JoJo's Bizarre Adventure. It's just it's a telling of all of these this family, the Joe Star bloodline, and they're going on these wacky adventures. Some might say it's bizarre. Stop. I, <laughs> just stop right now. But no. But when it comes to the scores, it was being composed by three different composers. So for part one, it was composed by Hayato Matsuo. Second part, part two, called Battle Tendency, was composed by Taku Iwasaki. And then for part three through five, it was composed by Yugo Kano. Mm -hmm. Every single piece of music within those five parts sounds so distinct. Like, each one is so unique to its part. Like, part one is a gothic horror-esque anime. And Matsuo really feeds into that. While part five, Yugo Kano's score makes it sound like it's a gangster flick because that's what it is it's a gangster show and of course you have to talk about the themes the three main joe stars from parts three to five jotaro kujo josuke higashikata and giorno giovanna Mm -hmm. those are super distinct themes not no one theme sounds the same and yet there are influences of each other theme within them. So like in Josuke's theme, you have hints of the Stardust Crusaders theme, which is uh, Jotaro's theme. And then you have Giorno's theme, which also has hints of Jotaro's theme, but also Josuke's theme. Again, building off of that. Yeah. It sounds, it's great. I would say for me, I'm going to say a couple of movies and then talk a little bit about <coughs> and one that kind of goes, it's not a movie or a TV show. Um, but just a little preview. So for me, I love Knives Out. You know how much I love that movie. And the music for that just made it even more enjoyable. It was very like eerie and made you think a lot. And so it just brought me more enjoyment. Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. I loved that soundtrack. It wasn't just movie music. It was the soundtrack in general just made me fall in love with that movie. Any Star Wars movie has fantastic soundtrack. Um Go to the next movie. Lawrence of Arabia. Yes. Oh, ob- absolutely. Don't even get me started on Lawrence of Arabia. It is so what good. a fantastic film score. Uh, I would never watch it all the way through because it's like three hours long, but the film score is fantastic. <laughs> I love it. Um, and then the last one I want to go over is Halo. Halo Reach specifically. Halo yes. Reach specifically. Oh if my you God. have never played Halo before, it is, <laughs> is great. a game, a shooting game on xbox exclusively for xbox and if you love anything like gregorian chant no i would it's it's like that it's pretty much gregorian chant theme the opening theme for halo is like a gregorian chant that's incredible it It is a choice what a choice i love that it is bold and i love it and it's just something i would listen to like all the time and i do listen to it all the time and so with all the backgrounds and everything as well throughout halo throughout that game I don't think people realize as well how much music has an effect on how a video game does. With Halo, like every single Halo theme, it starts off with that chant, so and good. it's great. And Halo 2 even added the electric guitar. Which made it even better. Right. Okay, Angie, yeah. I, I, I feel bad because you're just... Like, I'm just... I, video game. <laughs> yeah. Right over, right over the head. head. Well, bringing it back to films, I mean, we can't, we cannot sit here and talk about film score uh, without talking about Bernard Herrmann. We can't do absolutely it. No, because 100%. he's the 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 what is he at this point? The great 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 yes. grandfather of 
all of us, we died in what, 76, 75? Taxi, the, the taxi driver score was a gift. <laughs> what? It was a gift. And I think another, like, another really powerful thing, like, talking about, because, you know, I'm here as the mu- the person who understands the music score, but, un- like, not as, you know, there's not a, as, a, as in-depth as you guys. But from understanding the, the score f- at, from a larger perspective and everything, like, if you look at Martin Scorsese as a director and his scores across the board, so many of them are adapted. And he does it. He picks the music. And, but, but the whole thing with Taxi Driver is that that is from scratch. He yeah. said, I want something that has this gothic... New York City feel, it needs, like, he, and he, he pulled in Harriman because who else would do it? It needs to have the feel of Psycho and the feel of Ghost and Mrs. Muir, and it needs to all come together in one, and he did it. And you get the horns, you get everything, and that is one of my favorite film scores of all time. And I love that score, too, because it still somehow has that New York jazz feel. Exactly. But it's n- not a jazz score. Mm-hmm. It's such right. a weird it's score. It's distorted just enough. Yeah, and it makes that movie seem really weird because it is. Yep. <laughs> you get, like, the whimsical things with the chimes, like, and you're like, how am I supposed to feel about this character? Which is how you feel the whole time anyway. Yes. Um, And the score just emphasizes Travis's character. I mean, yeah. hey, you think we were talking about Bernard Herman, you just you already you just mentioned Psycho. Oh yeah, the you man who talk changed about, it all. Like I I, I I will yeah. say I'm gonna say it right here. Bernard Herman is the biggie of film score. Like oh, yeah. He, absolutely one hundred percent. Especially when you look at Psycho and what like th- you obviously we know that that yeah. motif. Oh my gosh. Like come on. It's really? it it's perfectly sets up the tension and then once that scene, once that, you know, you get that, those strings, that's really yeah. very, very dissonant. You're just like, it, it, it feels dirty. It feels like, it makes you feel uneasy. And you, it feeds off of that. So like when something awful is happening, somebody's dying, like you're supposed to feel yep. uneasy. And it's just like, and when it, the, when the, after that, and like it starts and it gets dropped mm-hmm. to a, like a low, really low. It's like, yep. okay, re, the scene is resolved. But like you still feel like there's this ongoing tension. You're just like, okay, I I feel uncomfortable. What's yep. happening next? And then this, what's also really fascinating when you link about that scene, and I think we've talked about this before. The scene after Marion dies, the music just cuts off, and it's just the shower. That had to be purposeful because it we we fail to realize that it's not just the music, like instruments or anything that sort of adds a score. It just the environment around you like you could just have trees whistling or a shower just going down and that adds it's also the timing of it as well right mm-hmm. exactly it's not just the music itself but the timing, the timing of it. and i just i want to i want to take a second to talk about what we're talking about psycho you know for people out there who are like oh maybe this is something that i want to do like maybe i but i don't have any experience it's like just knowing these little things that like bernard Herrmann orchestrated that he he conducted literally just an orchestra it was all strings and he put the mics right up next to the strings so that it would be so dissonant there would be no reverberations he could do that by yourself who knows maybe you can write a score now i mean kind of going off that a lot of the scores nowadays are more digital anyway exactly so, like you can literally write your own score like on your computer yeah mm-hmm. yeah joker use cubase which is like one of the top one of the top running uh music programs and look look at how that score has impacted that film. And again, one of the great things about film scores is that you can have those original compositions and then, you know, mix it with new with newer like or old school themes. Like when you think about the score for Joker and how it paired Yonder Tears score, you know, using all digital, but also pairing it with Gary Glitter Jr.'s Rock and Roll Part Two, it shows the duality of the of Arthur Fleck, like the the Gary Glitters, the Rock and Roll Part Two, the, uh, the Hey song that you that you would hear at like football games and everything. It's sort of like this carefree, um, I don't I don't care attitude. But then you have the actual legitimate, like the original composition that shows the pain and torture that's going through Arthur Fleck's mind because he's you know every day is his last, and today at this point what was going to be his last. Mm-hmm. And that's really cool. And that's and he and she's not the only one naturally. I mean we saw like we you mentioned into the Spider Verse that they use it all the time. Yep. We Scorsese. Yeah. Um I even even there are some other Japanese composers that do that as well. Yep. I'm looking at Norhito Sumitomo for all for those of you who don't know, uh, he composed a movie that I have yet to talk about and I've been really high on this film, even though I'm, I'm a bit I okay, admittedly I'm a little bit of a weeb. Just saying, mm-hmm. um, but it's okay. But 
Dragon Ball and Dragon Ball Super Broly, which is the movie that came out though came out last January, and incredibly successful, one of the most successful anime movies of all time. But it paired the original Dragon Ball opening theme, the Chala Head Chala theme, and he composed an entirely new score pairing it with that. So mm-hmm. it's just it sounds so different. And there's like a lot of rock influence a lot later. He is what he's what he does with that again, pairing an old school theme that everybody remembers if you're a big anime fan. You you know that theme. And then it pairs it with something completely different, something new, something unique to Dragon Ball. It creates is something that's just not just fun to listen to, but also it sets the tone for the rest of the film. Yeah. And I mean, you can't even, I mean, we're jumping, but like, if you look at someone like Ludwig Jorensen and we talk about him and what he's done. Oh my gosh. Like, well, like, first of all, like, I, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this, like the full story. I, I know it cause I love Community. I oh, love yeah. Community. It's the show that show. NBC forgot. It's so good. But that's where Ludwig Jorensen really got his like first kind of major, major gig. Wisp, wisp, I'm doing quotes. Um. <laughs> Uh, but and, and he met Donald, uh, yeah, Donald Glover, and they start working together. Now he does everything with Donald Glover, Childish Gambino. But because he knows Ryan, knew Ryan Coogler from USC, and that's where he got, and so he got roped into the Creed movies, and of course Black Panther, which he won his Oscar for. And you can't forget about the Mandalorian. You can't forget as about well. the Mandalorian. He's so responsible for that hype, and like, but the but the other thing too with like bringing bringing together culture and cinematic history, like. Mm-hmm. The Creed movies, I swear to God, I had day. I'm going to talk about Rocky every time I come on your podcast. Um, but, like, the Creed movies are n- would not be what they were without Ludwig Jorensen taking Bill Conti's original score and original music and then translating it into a new culture and yep. using artists who can actively portray that and create new music that, like, you could just listen to outside. Mm-hmm. Of a film, and I think that had such power and speaks to what kind of composer and artist that Jorensen is. Yeah, and like you mentioned, Black Panther, we have to talk about like the cultural influences that yeah. Black Panther yeah. had. Like a, a lot of that, there's so many African influence, but that's because he spent time to travel to Africa and he went to different countries and listened to the music. And he, that's all of those that listening to all that influenced the way that he created that score. And that score is so unique. Unlike any other superhero score that you ever heard of to the point where like, you don't even think it's a superhero score. Right. Exactly. And that's what sets like last time I was on here, we talked about superhero movies a little bit and how I'm like so far removed from them. But black Panther is one of the ones that I saw and thoroughly enjoyed because it felt like a film. It yep. didn't feel like I was watching a superhero thing. I was watching a film. Yeah. I mean, with a lot of the music that's coming out, it's so diverse. And that's why yeah. people are drawn to it. Because so many people can pick out what they want as far as the music that's in it. Yeah. There's a lot of distinct sounds. And every composer obviously has a distinct... Like, Hans Zimmer has his sound. Mm-hmm. Same with John Williams has his sound. And then you have guys like Giacchino who has his sound. Or mm-hmm. you have Guillaume D'Artier who has her sound. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, there's... It's so... It's so varied. Like... When we talk about film scores, like, oh, you you might mention somebody that I've never heard of. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's really cool. I want to check that person out. And then you check them out. Like, oh, wow, I actually really do like this. Mm-hmm. And it's really cool that we get to see that mm-hmm. and talk about that. But I also want to talk about sometimes films, film scores, not just make good films great, but they can also make bad films tolerable. I remember, I, I know what mine was. And I was Batman versus Superman. Yes. Okay. Okay. So okay. I'm, Well, okay. So I was... <laughs> Listening to the score a little bit earlier, because I was thinking about this could be one of the movies. To be honest with you, I didn't think the score was all that great when it comes to the movie. To be honest with you, just to be honest with you, just to be, but you make your point though. Make okay, so point. one of the things that I personally enjoy is that Junkie XL worked on the score, and he's up and coming. He also did 300 Rise of an Empire. What I loved about Junkie XL, what he did specifically with Batman, it's specifically Batman's what he did for his theme, because he, he did the Batman theme. And it just, it makes it feel more like the Batman from the Dark Knight Returns yeah. rather than just being like, oh, he's taking influences from the uh, from the Elfman score from the 89 Batman or he's taking a uh, cue from Hans Zimmer. Like, it yeah. felt completely distinct. Mm-hmm. However, he also had to placate to the Hans Zimmer score that he created with Man of Steel, yep. which I think is probably the best Superman score since John Williams' Superman. 
Yeah. I'd say for me, one that comes to mind, I had to look this up first, but Tron Legacy is the movie that comes to mind that is fantastic with the music that it has. The music is so good in the movie, but the movie is just gosh awful. It is not good. It's one of those movies where like the late 2000s, early 2010s, Mm -hmm. that Disney just like makes it to make it to make some money and it's there, but the film score is just fantastic it captures what it's trying to capture even though like the actors and the plot in general just doesn't capture it but the music itself ah fantastic i mean that's daft punk you can't go wrong with daft Daft punk Punk. no you cannot i think there are a lot of movies that like were okay like not that they were like bad movies but i think there are are several movies and a couple come to mind like okay Uh, fantastic mr fox freaks me out (laughs) and so does i love dogs (laughs) But let me tell you what, those scores are good. And, like, for me, that makes it a little bit more worth it. But the one that, like, really comes to mind, is, and it's recent, um, is The King. Ooh, um, okay. David Michoud's The King with Timothy Chalamet and Joel Egerton. Um, as somebody who knows the Henry ad, the, the Henry the Henry the Fourth Part One, Part Two, Henry the Fifth, um, it took a lot of liberty, that screenplay <laughs> did, that adaptation. And it was still good. I mean, Timothy Chalamet is a wonderful actor. Um, they did this really great job of like the, the, the color, the colorist of it, the cinematography, like it was all very well done, but it was like an okay film. Yeah. What really did it was Nicholas Bertel, who, you know, Moonlight, Feel Street Good Talk, Nicholas Bertel's awesome. The score for that itself was, it kind of went back to these, like this orchestral root without being too much. And it's kind of that, like you were talking about environmental sounds where like the idea of armor starts to come in as a musical instrument and a piece of the score. So like, I didn't really like that film, but I'll tell you what, I sometimes I will put on that soundtrack and just crank out a bunch of stuff because it's so good and you can sit there and listen to it and let it seep in. And if you want to put a category of movies as far as movies that had really good film scores, but the movie wasn't great, like almost any sequel that had... (laughs) Almost any sequel that had a really good film score, so like any of the Star Wars prequels, any of the mm-hmm. Star Wars that just came out, I would say Pirates of the Caribbean. Oh yeah, absolutely. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. The Curse At of World the Black End. Curse of the Black Pearl is fantastic. Like this, but like after but that, I think as it got progressive, as they kept doing more, the score stayed the same, but the movie dipped. Yeah, so, and that just like for most movies that have a lot of sequels, it just seems like if they have a really strong film score, it's gonna stay that way. But the film's gonna dip. Yeah, especially yeah. Pirates of the Caribbean, Dead Man Tell, Tell No Tales. They took the iconic pirates theme and they tried to like make it a dance theme, and it just doesn't. And oh, it didn't work. It, it it felt it felt gross. And I and honestly, that's what turned me off from going to see the movie. Like you do not mess with that score. Mm-mm. There are yeah. some things that you just you can't touch. Like in, even with sequels. Okay, this is personal. This is very personal. Okay. I hate Frozen. <laughs> I really don't like Frozen. That's fair. Frozen 2. The music saved Frozen. It did. Yeah, the it music did. really did save Frozen. Like, I could not enjoy that film at all without the score. And Frozen 2 sort of... It, I, I enjoyed the movie. I enjoyed Frozen 2, and I talked about how much I like Frozen 2. But the, the music, man... I like I could have listened this is the first time I ever like chose to listen to a sco- like a song from Frozen from a Frozen movie. Like Let It Go was abysmal. Like it's a great song. Great song, but I heard it all the time and I was like, I- I'm done. What? I'm done with Frozen. It's still abysmal. <laughs> it's still abysmal. <laughs> but into the unknown and like show yourself in the, the um ballad with Sven and uh Kristoff. Yes. <laughs> so good. It is it's great. And like and it's it's another thing too. And I don't think we have, I've never really like talked about is that, you know, sort of the progression of film scores, especially if you're a one composer who's done multiple films, right. take out where, you know, big MCU, me and you are big MCU fans, Justin, take Alan Silvestri, the way that his score from the first Avengers and listen to the score from Endgame, you can tell that he has learned and sort of improved and progressed the theme, the main Avengers theme, which is one of the, it's becoming one of the more iconic modern film score like themes alongside like the 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 original the dark knight theme and any and stuff like that you see the progression he's taking a lot of doing a lot of really different and smart things in his score well speaking of a smart thing in his score i mean if somebody doesn't know this i would love to give this tidbit to you so going from infinity war the beginning of infinity war to the beginning of endgame so, if you listen closely to the very, very beginning of the film and that score, half of the orchestra is taken away. 
which is like insane to even think about that because of like half the population is missing and gone because of what happened in Infinity War, they do the exact same thing in the film score. And that, I love to see stuff like yeah. that. Literally, they are, the plot is in the film score and it is fantastic. Yeah. And Those are the best films too. The best films that like pair up with the best film scores. That's that's when you when you notice that when you can notice those things. That's when you're like, oh. and even maybe other people are still like that's a not good film score or film. But you're like yes, but if you just saw this one tiny little thing, you would have this <laughs> amount just of appreciation listen. That just I listen. Have. Right? Yeah. One of the things I think we sort of hit on, like what scores add to films that are unique. Like, mm-hmm. what can it? What can a good score do for a film that visual effects can't do? That like a good, like a very well designed set can't do. And I think we already touched on that. Adding to the the feel of a movie, yep. like listening to the like a score can you can have a really good emotional scene, but it gets like it hits you harder with the with the score, like that's paired with it. I mean, what are the two things that drive people to movies? Notoriety and feelings. Yep. Like, and that, I think, what music does in film is it drives feelings. And feelings will drive you to be more invested in a character and more Mm -hmm. invested in a scene. And that is exactly what music does for a film. All right, so we're going (laughs) to... I have a little game for us to play today. So each of us came in here with three composers and, like, a piece from each of them to sort of reference to in in this sort of little game. So what we're going to do is, it's called Radar Composers. So you know how we have like Radar Professors and stuff like that. We're going to do Radar Composers. So we're going to candidly, honestly, rate our composer or whatever the the song that you reference on a scale of one to 10. You have to talk talk about what they do well, what they didn't do well. And if you were to make a movie, you can pick the genre, just make sure you keep it consistent. Would you honestly want this person to score your film and why? All right, well, I mean, for those of you who know me, you know I'm a huge, huge, huge Hans Zimmer fan. But I'm going to go with a movie that is not as well known, Gladiator. Oh, my gosh. So the the music that I chose for this movie is the beginning, the battle sequence. It is my favorite. The emotion in it, it just drives you. Honestly, the battle sequence isn't one of my favorites to watch. I mean, it's visually fantastic. But just hearing it, it just make, takes me to another place. When I'm just hearing it, I'm not even watching the movie. So when something does that to you as music, and it's not even involved in the movie, it's fantastic. It's great. On a scale of 1 to 10, I would put this at like a 7 or an 8. As well, because like there's so many great things that Hans Zimmer does. I think like Inception and all of those, that would be like a 9 or a 10. This is right at 7 or 8. I mean, it's still one of the best that he has done. But I would put it at that rating. And then if I was to make a movie, would I honestly use this type of film score? Why or why not? Yeah, I would definitely. Especially like when I mean, we're talking about a film that had to do with like history any historical kind of film that has to do with like this kind of roman empire kind of feel and like the the ancient times ancient days i would definitely use a score like this and with one of those types of movies i think it would do well okay all right so i'm going to talk about a composer name his name is brian tyler uh, he's done a lot of again action films he's done all five of the nine fast and the furious films and I chose the song Into Eternity from Thor The Dark World. What I really like, it's the only song in that movie that I actually really, I 100% enjoy. It's the, for context, this is the scene where Thor's mother has passed, has died, and it's her funeral. And it's very, it's not like super bombastic. It's very, very, very subtle. It's very, like, there's, there's some chanting, there's, there's a choir, and it just it feels like well it feels like a theme that you would that you would play during a funeral. Mm-hmm. It it pairs well visually with the film. Uh, a lot of the beats were created because the director heard the score, heard this song, and he created some of the beats, like the beat where Loki just in a subtle fit of rage, he just hit all the the desks and chairs just sort of fly away from it. And he just tenses up, and just everything just gets scattered in his prison cell. And he, the director created that beat because he heard that score. Mm-hmm. But if I were to be completely honest, on a scale of 1 to 10, I'd give Brian Tyler like a 4. Because none of his scores are really memorable. Yeah. 
you don't really pick out when you when you're thinking about like great film composers you're not like oh man you got to hear this brian tyler yeah. score man <laughs> brian yeah. tyler great. isn't really that like right. composer name that he, right. he a lot of the his notoriety comes from the fact that he has paired with other more notable composers he he paired with gary goldsmith he used some things from jerry goldsmith he paired with danny mm-hmm. elfman mm-hmm. but on his own he's just if everything just feels like it is just background noise. And sometimes, and for a lot of his movies, that's not what you need. And so I, I, I'm a big horror person. So if I were to make a movie, if I wanted to make a horror movie, I would not want him anywhere Ugh. near like a horror film. Right. Because like mu- horror films really play off of music. Obviously, we think about Friday the 13th, Halloween, yeah. Nightmare on Elm Street. Like horror films do kind of feed off of these kind of really, I, very noticeable, very, very iconic themes. And right. Brian Tyler is just not that kind of composer. Mm-hmm. So, I'm going posthumous here for a second, um, and then I have another one. But I feel, felt like I could talk about post Jerry Goldsmith. Yes, <laughs> what a man. Um, Rest in peace. Uh, but, um, you know, Jerry Goldsmith, Chinatown, one of my favorite movies I ever saw that way too young. Should not have seen that at the age I saw that. Um, but yes. he, The Omen. Yes. Planet of the Apes. Of course. Mm. You gotta talk about Those the three apes. alone, if you just looked at a man who did score for those three movies and don't look at all the other wonderful, like Rambo First Blood and like Alien. Yeah. Like he did all those too. But like... Jerry Goldsmith was a wizard. And for me personally, like, you know, the omen is not the omen without the theme. You know, Mm -hmm. Planet of the Apes is not Planet of the Apes without Charlton Heston melting down on the sand when it pans over to the Statue of Liberty half covered and you hear that score playing. Right. Um, And for me personally... um, as a, I guess from a filmmaker perspective, like if I were if I were making these production design decisions, I would so work with Jerry Goldsmith. Whether he wanted to do extended techniques or not, like Jerry Goldsmith knew what he was doing and knew how to bring drama to something across genres. So mm-hmm. like you you look at the Omen versus just another standard drama. He knows what he's doing, and I mean, who knows what he was doing? He's dead. But I would love to work with him. Yeah, of course you got like, something. Like I don't know, Jerry, I don't know what else you want me to say. I mean, what what else can be said? You know what I mean? Yeah. Some of these composers, like they go without saying. Yeah. Why why these composers are great? Mm-hmm. Gonna talk about one that we just talked about earlier, Ludwig Jorensen. I love to, him. I love so him good. so much. So, so I have to talk about Black Panther score. Great. They sleep on the Creed two score. Listen, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna tell you why that score is. I think it's on par with the Black Panther score. This, I'm talking about Drago's Walkout. Don't even get me started yes. on Drago's Walkout. Yes, <laughs> Drago's Walkout is the single best song from Creed 2, better than any of the songs in the soundtrack, better than anything else. Like that theme alone yeah. made me want made me root for Victor Drago. Like I was like, I yeah. please, I I want you to win. There's something so regal and also like very primal about it at the it same feel, time. You remember if you so take if you take and you take it back to Rocky Four. It just it gives you that same uh, intimidating feel that Ivan Drago had when he when you just when he would look at Rocky. I must break you. Like where you're like, ooh, he's, he's intimidating. I I would want to get on his side. That theme creates that same exact feeling for Victor Drago. And it yep. just shows the power of music because what is this twenty or thirty years after that exactly. movie? Oh my gosh, just fantastic. And it gives you that feel from Rocky. And it does because it's because you know, you take Rocky 4 and you take Creed 2. It's a development of the same story. Right. So you get that that last training montage where you get exactly what you got in Rocky 4, nature versus machine, where right. the Soviet Union was the machine and their nature and you know, you've got Michael B. Jordan out in the desert training. You get the same exact thing with the same exact influences, but Ludwig Jornsen says, no, it's a new story. Here's this and this and this. And yes. one of the best things that I love about the song is that it feels like a homecoming to for not just Victor Drago, but Ivan Drago yeah. as well. This is a homecoming for him. Like you, you hear he's before the song starts, you Ivan Drago pats his son on the shoulder, he says, Listen, and you hear the Drago. Oh, Drago. I, God, I love that movie. <laughs> Drago. And and then as you're walking, you're following him down the down the uh corridor, and he's about to come out and you he's you hear those those 
first few notes, and as soon as he gets out, you see like, a sweeping shot of the entire mm. arena, and then the fire starts coming up, and that's when the theme kicks in hard. I can hear and it. It's like playing so loudly in my head and it's right like now. With the sparks and everything, I'm just like. Oh I, I, this is like so, such a great entrance theme. It, is. it fits so perfectly, not just for the character of Ivan, mm -hmm. for the character of Victor, for what they're going, they're trying to go for, for that, for the dynamic between those two. And then you pair that with I Will Go to War, which exactly. is, which is Creed's. And it just, the dynamic is there and it's created not by dialogue. It's created by the music. Mm -hmm. I think it's also very powerful and it's a choice between Kugler and uh, Jorgensen that Tessa Mae Thompson's character of Bianca is is, it, is an input, is a diegetic piece yeah. of the score. And that's so powerful too, because it just heightens the themes that he's already presenting. Yeah. So grading the composer, I think, come on. 10. We were just, 10. Perfect 10. 10. It's perfect a perfect 10. 10. Can we give it 11? Yeah. I'm giving yeah. it 11. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. No, 20. We're going to, I'm going to, I'm going to one up you. God, he's so good. He just knows what he's doing. Uh, and yeah, if, if I were to make a film, like if I want to do with like a horror film, so I'm gonna stick with the horror film trend. Would I actually have Jorgensen score my film? I would, but it, there's a catch. I would if it's just like a pulp slasher kind of film. Yeah. I want want something that's very. If I'm not go, if I'm going for a slow burn, and granted, he's perfectly good at that. Like if you listen to Fruitvale Station, I wouldn't want to do him to do slow burn. But I still would want him mm -hmm. to sort of like I would love some like influence or output input yeah. from him. But like if I'm doing like a pulp slasher, like a psychological thriller, yeah. you bet I'm getting him on that score. Oh, <laughs> you, there is no way, and no chance. Another slow. Can I do another one now? Are we do going in yeah. an order? Oh, um, go keep going. Another is and he's oh, so he's done a couple of films. He's he's a British musician known as the Hacks and Cloak, Bo uh, Bobby Curlick. He sure. was who Ari Aster got to do Midsummer, and I think because he used. Like, um, Ari, it's like as a writer's mm -hmm. tool, he used his music and then he said, oh, I need this music. And I think when you watch Midsummer, what's so powerful about it is that the score allows for that slow burn while at the same time you can tell it's Scandinavian. Like mm -hmm. you can tell there's Eastern European influence in the instruments that make it so eerie and so creepy. And it's those strings that drag out that really, really make that film go the extra mile. So that's definitely someone to look out for if you need, or if you're looking for or any, like, slow burns coming out. Who knows what he's doing? He might be doing more scores. All right, number two. This is probably one that you guys probably haven't heard of. This is David Holmes. If you've ever seen any of the Ocean's 11, 12, or 13 yeah. movies, he is the one who did the score for that. So very jazzy score. I'm a jazz drummer, so I love jazz. Mm -hmm. uh, this is why he's in, like, one of my hey, top Justin. of all time. Yes. You like jazz? I love jazz. <laughs> Hate the B movie, but I like jazz. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So what David Holmes does with this movie is it just makes it seem like very, because to me, like jazz is fun, but sophisticated at the same time. So what does it do to a movie that is about pretty much like a robbing the bank kind of movie is that it makes it look fun, but sophisticated at the same time. <laughs> and so on a scale of one to 10, as far as these kind of movies, got to put it at least a nine or a 10. Like he did a fantastic job. And from all thir from all three movies, both 11, 12, and 13, I think 12 was the best, but all three, it's very consistent in the quality that he brought to all three of those movies. But, I mean, if I were to make a movie, you know, whatever genre it would be, I don't think I would use him unless I knew that it needed a jazz kind of score. Because, like, with him, it's very easy to only want like this specific mm -hmm. only just the jazz so i don't think i would pick him if i am making a film score it's kind of like justin hurwitz too yeah. who did yeah. la la land mm -hmm. like you know what he can do but you're like i don't know if i want you for anything than you've already then other anything other than what you've already shown me that you can do right, right. so i'm gonna go ahead and cap this off with my with i'm gonna start us off uh i've mentioned him before norihito sumitomo i'll talk about the score for broly and particularly, this uh, the song is called Broly's Rage and Sorrow. So I'm, I'm assuming you guys haven't seen this. So I'm gonna try to sort of try to yes. try to sort of explain the scene that's that's about to happen. If you know Dragon Ball, you know that one of the big things about Dragon Ball is the fact that the the main characters, their race known as Saiyans, can achieve a form greater than their normal form, a also called the Super Saiyan. So Broly is a child that has been turned into a machine, like a, a fighting machine. And so, at this point of the film, there's there he's in this huge fight with Goku, 
And so Frieza, the the big bad of Dragon Ball Frieza, he kills Broly's father and he calls to him and says, Broly, look, your father was killed by a straight energy blast. He's lying, but Broly doesn't know that. And so when he sees his father is dead, like he just goes completely, he, he loses it. And it triggers his trans, his Super Saiyan transformation. Mm-hmm. What is so good about this scene? It's three things. One, it's very rare that you get to hear like a, a all male choir mm. in a in a in a film score. Like usually, you use all female choirs because they have like that angelic voice, or they can create something that's very eerie. You don't really get something like a lot of the like guys, and it's very very deep. Like they're tenor voices. The only time you really hear just males is like Gregorian chant, mm. like that kind of stuff. Come and it's the it, it it's very it, like it's straight tenor. They're tenor voices, and. It just it starts off with just the voices, nothing else. And so when he like starts getting completely starts like raging out, it you can hear the voices still in the background. They're like chanting something, and it's sort of on the line to talk about how Broly is like he's a weapon of war, and he's going he's going to become super powerful and everything like that. And so the the score's building and it's building and it's building. And then as soon as it happens, there's like this giant pillar of energy that that's, that pops from the ground. And he ri- and Broly rises from the ground like he is, oh my gosh, it makes him so feel so threatening. He is terrifying. Like the way, not just visually, like because obviously the visual is all green. You see nothing but like the spikes in his hair and his eyes are red. And the score is nothing but like viola, violin, and some, some you know, trombones. And it just it makes it feel so threatening. He is a presence, and you then it sort of builds. It keeps building. It maintains that uh, sort of tone throughout the rest of the scene. Like yeah. he just feels like a monster, and I love that. It's so great. It's one of the best moments in that entire movie. I would I have to rate that at like at least a nine. But I would not have him score my my horror film no. for that exact reason. Because he's so good at like the big epic moments, mm-hmm. not the really subtle moments that are like where you need, like in the Invisible Man, which is coming out uh, at the time at the time of the recording, it'll be coming it'll be coming out on Friday, where you have moments where a person is in one scene, like you have the scene frame, one person's like on the right side of the frame, so you know somebody's there. Yep. You can't see them, but somebody's there. You, that kind of subtlety. There's no He's element not good of surprise. That. There has to be some sort of element of surprise in a skin, uh, music score. Yes. Correct. So then I'll go with my last one. So if you guys have seen any of the earlier Pixar films, you're going to most likely know who this is. Randy Newman. Uh, he is the one that scored any of the music that you've heard. Um, you Got a Friend of Me. He is the one who created that, and he's also the one who sung that. And if you've seen any Toy Story film, he is in it. Um, and I think he transformed Pixar. He transformed what the, at least what animated films, what that score looks like, because you have a lot of animated films nowadays that have that kind of like action. You take it from like an action, live action movie, those kind of action kind of sequences, you take that in. But what Randy Newman did is he added fun. It it just like when I hear you got a friend of me, I think of like fun, hanging out with my family kind of thing. And he does that in almost every single film that he's done. So I think he transformed animated films. Um, As far as one to ten, I would give him a nine or a ten. Definitely a nine or a ten in this. But like if I were nowadays, honestly, if I were to make an animated film, I don't think I would use because him because I think animated film was just going in a different kind of place than it was yeah. when this started, what, 1995, and 1996? Then, it was, like, wholesome. and Not that they're not wholesome now, but, like, the whole point of animated films and, like, the early Pixar movies were all about just, like, innocence and having fun and feeling good. Yeah. And he I, did that. Yeah, I now, think it's at the peak where, I mean, I can't you know, let you throw yourself away from Toy Story 4. I think that's, like, the peak of him. And I could see him making... Obviously, he's going to make a couple more movies with Pixar, but yeah. I just can't really see him with a animated film nowadays. Yeah, um and also like that the like obviously you got a friend in me that transcends just being from Toy Story. Like I mean that goes for all the Newmans. They all know what they're doing. The yes. whole family knows what they're doing. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> Alright, so we're gonna move on to our reshoot segment. You already know what this is for those who are new. It's just sort of like a one sort of general question to pose to close out the show. Guys, I'm gonna ask you and be completely candid. Genre of film. What genre has the best score? I want to say action so badly, 
But I don't like this genre. I don't usually watch it. But I gotta say horror. Horror, I think, has I think some horror, of the best. Horror has the most... Uh, you're Yes, you're right. Horror has the most lasting scores that, well, like, stick with you right in your chest well, or thing, in your gut. And the thing is, the reason I picked this is because horror isn't horror without its music. Yeah, look at Psycho, Halloween. Yep. Those are the two big ones, you know? Those alone. Wow, I was, I was, I was, I was hoping there was gonna be a little bit of a debate. Now we're all in agreement. We're all in we're agreement. All agreement. Oh my gosh. Oh no. <laughs> but no, what is so? Yeah, like you, like you just said, like horror films are nothing without the score. Yeah. Like you cannot, the same type of terror that you get from Halloween would not be the same without you, without that John Carpenter, mm -hmm. that synthesizer. Oh man. Woo. Or like even Friday the Thirteenth, like. Those, those, like the chases for like the, your final girl and Jason, like they wouldn't be the same with if you didn't have that kind of if you didn't have that score. Mm -hmm. So, but like, man, horror films, like you just you don't even think about it until you're like you walk yeah. back and you're, you hear it's playing in your head and you're just like ugh, you get the chills. Yeah. Like I remember the Conjuring, listening to the Conjuring score, and I was I couldn't. Sometimes you just I'm just like laying in bed awake, like I can't go to sleep. Nope, because I, mean, I, I remember because I'm hearing I'm hearing the themes and I'm remembering the scenes and I'm just like mm -mm, and nope, even not if me. You look at how horror is evolving as a drama or as a drama as a genre. The music is evolving with it. Yes. In the way that it's like, I mean, if you look at Ari Aster, he is changing the whole game. But like, even Robert Eggers, like that balance between horror and drama is becoming the more popular thing in the horror genre, and the music is evolving with it, which is mm -hmm. so important because if you know if you have the 1980 or your 1970 John Carpenter synthesizer music tacked onto a horror film made in 2020, 2021, it's not going to hold the same thing. So everything's evolving and it's really interesting to see like how far things are going to go. That's definitely true because I feel like you can almost sometimes do too much with trying to get that shock and awe. Yeah. But I mean, as long as they kind of keep it mellow a little bit and then mm -hmm. just come at you, yeah, that's slow it, I think it's always just going to, be one of the best as far as a genre you know, for music. it applies to not just film scores but just horror movies in general subtlety is key yes you definitely. have the best horror films are the ones that are slow the ones that that, that are subtle with their scares and the same thing with the score the horror scores the best ones are the ones that are, are subtle not super like in your face and sometimes when you see like these like low budget horror films the ones that are like made for like peanuts and like or five dollars <laughs> in a pack of snickers like paranormal activity where you're just like you oh don't need that yeah but like but also again subtle again sometimes it's it is very subtle but sometimes like the later ones really get very in your face yeah and that's not that that to me that doesn't a horror movie make yeah horror films man the genre is just those scores of that genre just Iconic. Yep. Mm -hmm. I mean, Absolutely. you uh, and again, you could make the case for like the action genre. Even like, come on, some of the most like Mission Impossible, like with the Indian, like Indiana Jones. And I think with horror, the thing is, it it's its own thing. I think with like action and then like adventure, some of those like yeah. they kind of cross boundaries a little bit with horror. Yeah. Horror is horror. Yeah. You cannot exactly. change horror. Like you look at something like if you want to talk iconic action adventure kind of theme, you look at Jurassic Park. Yeah. You look at Jaws, but then at the same time, it's kind those of those like, are kind of things that are crossing from drama to horror, from action to horror. Like it's even, all sprinkled in, you know. Right, like, but with horror, you're not getting anything else. You're exactly. just getting horror. It's horror. So guys, that's that's gonna end this episode of Cinema Talk. You, you we had you if you can't already tell, we had a blast doing this. Oh yeah, we did. This we're all big movie fans. We're all big <laughs> that's music us fans. limiting us. Yeah, I'm, that's I'm us trying, limiting ourselves. <laughs> we're look, we're trying to we're trying to humble ourselves here. We're we're a humble podcast here. Yes. Thank you guys so much for being on for this reunion. Yeah. It was great having you guys on. Of course, just bouncing off each other. Like you could tell we this was great. Yes. We all had yeah. a great time. And I hope you guys had a great time. I'm I'm just Speaking for myself, but I hope you guys had a great time doing this. Oh, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, guys. So we're going to sign out here. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at CinemaTalk19 and follow us at inst on Instagram at CinemaTalk2020. This has been CinemaTalk and Scene. <laughs>